It's not whiskey, honest. <laughs> Don't coat tea. Okay, well, everybody in Zoom land, you're not forgotten. So, and of course, everybody here in the flesh. It's so great to see flesh after the next few years. I'm meeting all these people who are like thumbnails on my computer screen on Zoom classes and finding out how tall people are or sometimes disappointingly short. You know? But it's still great. It's like human. I have Scorpio rising, so I'll say all sorts of things. And it's good to smell you. Okay, well, let me get serious. Got a serious topic here. So years and years ago, before I did honest work as an astrologer, I, I worked for a while on a project for the National Institute of Mental Health, big government project. It was called the Urban Policy Study. Um, basically, we did a statistical sample, a couple of thousand people, happened to be in North Carolina, comparing uh, demographics and psychological profiles with their levels of uh, social and political participation in their communities. Try to stay awake, it'll be worth it. <laughs> now I was uh, doing the computer stuff, that's kind of not my field, but punch cards and all of that. And I discovered that we had uh, these psychological profiles statistical sample worth two or $3 million, $1,975, and uh, people's birth dates. And so, you know what my next thought was? <laughs> and this was uh, absolute malfeasance, uh, you know, your, your, your tax dollars at work after hours, so to speak. And I correlated people's responses to these questions with their sun signs. That's about as far as I could go without doing 10 to 20 and 11 with, but you know, just sun sign astrology. Example, uh, you go to a party in which some of the people are strangers and some are people you know well. Do you mostly meet the strangers or, or mostly talk to the people you know well? What sign is number one for talking to the people they know well? Cancer. No surprise, but there was numbers, statistics. We were interested in uh, people's level of well-being. And we asked them, uh, you know, how often are you in good spirits? You know, sometimes seldom, never, you know, that kind of thing. But somebody who's always in good spirits, but chronic insomnia, stomach trouble, and headaches, we knew which box to put them in. It was a, a fairly complex scale. It's the most miserable sign in the zodiac, Scorpio. <laughs> Now, there's lies, and there's damned lies, and there's statistics, of, of course. You know, this is not how I would counsel a Scorpio. Might be how I would counsel the cancer, though. You don't have to talk to everybody. You know? Be yourself. So, again, this is 1975. And uh, I, I had this incredible treasure. I was like proof of astrology. And so I quit my job and I, I collected unemployment insurance and I, I couldn't afford to heat my house. I put on a wool hat and a scarf and, and I, I type, I was writing a book, a uh, book uh, titled uh, New Evidence for an Old Art. You know, there it is. And I, you know, I was, I'm in my 20s, so I'm a little naive and I'm spending my millions of dollars. I'm kind of preparing my conversation with uh, Johnny Carson, I figured that was going to happen. You know? And of course, I get rejection after rejection after rejection. The book never got published. And I'm glad because I would not want to be labeled as a statistical astrologer and pigeonholed in that way. God bless them, but that's not what I am. So it was God taking care of a fool that the book never got published. But the whole point of this is that one of the rejections guy took the time to actually say a few things. Exact quote, words that sunk into my soul. The thrust of modern astrological publishing is egocentric, and I expect it will always remain that way. Wow. So is that true? You know, do we actually resemble that remark? Spirituality 
is always about identifying with something that lies beyond our egos, beyond our personalities. Yet so much astrology in practice is me, me, me. It's just simply the way it is. Now, a lot of astrology legitimately is not in that spiritual category. I mean, we have financial astrologers. We, we don't want to get guru advice from our financial astrologer. You know, we got quarry astrologers. Where did I lose my wallet? You know, call somebody and they're going to set up an orary chart. I'm not trying to beat anybody up for not doing spiritual astrology, but uh, it gets a little complicated. So spirituality, like astrology, is a big tent. They're both big tents. They're both complicated. And we have so many religions and some are pro-astrology, some are anti-astrology, and some just don't seem to pay it any attention at all. And then we have in the present world, this fastest growing uh, religious, in quotes, demographic, spiritual, but not religious. And that's, a, I think, fair to say an awful lot of our Natural clients are in that kind of category, spiritual, but not religious. But all religions and all spirituality speak of the link between the conscious mind, the ego consciousness, and something far, far vaster than that. That's almost the definition of spirituality. They're all about the ego becoming more transparent to the vastness around us. The Judeo-Christian and Islamic traditions always, of course, speak of the soul. Hinduism is kind of close to that, although a little bit different. A famous deep line in Hinduism, Atman and Brahman are one. Atman, basically soul. Brahman, the infinite, the divine. Atman and Brahman are one. The further in you go, the bigger it gets until eventually deep in the core of you is everything, the divine. The Buddhists take it a step further. They don't even really believe in the individual soul, viewing that as a complete illusion, that there is nothing but the vastness, nothing but this great oneness or to be strictly Buddhist, this great zero-ness. That's one to wrap your head around. All the spiritual paths are suspicious of us becoming too identified with the ego, as if it were the only reality. And yet, once again, so much astrology is you and your story, you and your version of your life, you and your narrative and explanation of yourself. Now, speaking of this vastness, this luminous emptiness out there, as the Buddhists would call it, to some people that might seem flaky. In the light of, here's a hilarious term, common sense, in the light of common sense, if you want to understand common sense, turn on your television, watch a situation comedy, and there's common sense. What passes for common sense in the modern world is the triumph of existentialism and materialism. The life, uh, life here is meaningless, random. Uh, the, the gospel of the 21st century shit happens, you know, as the basic logic of the universe. Common sense. And so from this common sense perspective, all this talk of the vastness of our spiritual natures and so on might seem flaky, but there is a simple proof that the larger self exists, a simple logical proof. Here it comes. It's a cartoon you've seen many times, three panels. In the first panel, the protagonist is faced with some kind of dilemma, some kind of problem. In the second panel, the light bulb lights over the head. In the third panel, the, the protagonist uh, applies the stupid solution to the problem. We all get a laugh out of it. The middle panel is the secret. 
light bulb lights over the head. It's a metaphor that we have all lived many times. Where does that light bulb come from? What is the origin point of inspiration? How can we teach anyone through logical ab- academic means to be creative, for example? You can't. You simply can't. Where does creative inspiration come from? Talk to a, a novelist or a, a composer, you know. So what's your secret? Well, every morning at 4 a.m., I get up and I meditate and I burn incense and, and I begin to write, you know, before the vibrations of the world are with me. Brilliant, brilliant creative person brilliant poet. And they ask another one, same question. Well, I start drinking vodka at about eight (laughs) o'clock. Long about midnight, you know, I get out my guitar, you know, and brilliant songs that'll put tears in your eyes. Where does that stuff come from? We're all creative. We've all had inspiration. We've all had the light bulb light over our head. It's an utterly commonplace experience. And if you stop and think about it, it is proof that there is a vastness outside the ego consciousness. There is absolutely nothing flaky about this idea. We experience the proof of it daily, every one of us. Nothing flaky. And meanwhile, we have many of the conventional forms of astrology, which in practice often boil down to two things, a delineation of your personality traits and a set of predictions for your future. Here's who you are. Here's what's going to happen to you. That word delineation, I, I don't think I hear it as much as I used to. I used to really hate that word. You know, when I was a young astrologer, we're going to delineate a chart. And the image in my mind was, we're going to, here's your personality. We're going to put lines around it. You know, we're going to delineate your personality. Don't you step over those lines. Or are you going to violate my theories? And that, that annoys me. Huh. Maybe silly for a moment, but with a point, you know. So, of course, I'm sexy, but treacherous. I'm a scorpion. <laughs> scorpion is like that, right? Or, or, of course, I'm late. Of course, I'm late. I'm a Pisces. <laughs> and here, here's my favorite. This one in honor of my friend, Lauren Albandian. Of course, I don't believe in astrology. I'm a Capricorn. <laughs> Silly, I'm glad we're laughing. And then the the predictive stuff, this one gets a little more serious. I'm anticipating that the next 20 years of my life are going to be hell on earth because I'm an Aquarian and Pluto is entering Aquarius. (laughs) Feel the delineation, the little box, feel the focus on my personal narrative, feel the me, me, me in all of this. Again, I'm using simple kind of silly examples, but the point underlying them is serious. They're cartoon sketches, but even more sophisticated forms of astrology often behold the human ego uncritically, as if it reigned supreme, as if we were our egos, as if we were actually that simple. That belief is absolutely antithetical to spirituality. Can the two ever be reconciled? Well, I think so. Once, many, many years ago, I think it was at one of the UACs, I was invited to be on a panel, a few other astrologers, and it was like, uh, resolve the question, where is God in the chart? I was lucky enough to be one of the last ones to speak, like <laughs> batting cleanup, you know. And there's a, a lot of you know, intelligent, reflective statements made, a, a lot of them boiling down to Neptune, to Pisces, you know, to the, the kind of mystical, psychic symbolism in, in, in astrology, God in the chart. Then my turn came, and I, I pointed to the space around the chart, that every chart, whatever form it takes, you know, it's, it's against a field, there's space, it's on a page or a computer screen or something like that. 
that uh, that space that is literally beyond the planets, beyond the planets in your chart, deep space, the galaxy. No, galaxy isn't a big enough word. Universe, whatever that means, and it's a uh, mysterious infinity. Well, the most basic principle of astrology, the whole theory in four words, we all know them, as above, so below. That is the entire theory of astrology in four words. And so that spaciousness, literally the sky, exists inside of us too. It's above, so it's below. It's part of us. This is how we find what we might call God in the chart. Although when I'm saying God here, I don't mean the gentleman up there with the long white beard writing down your sins. You know, we're all more sophisticated than that. That infinity, that spaciousness, that unified field behind us all. It's there in every chart. Just think of it as the boundary around the chart. I mentioned some religions earlier than so many of the current religions on, on the earth that tend to view this world and our place in it as a miasma of temptations, traps. Call it samsara, maya, the great illusion, Call it this fallen world, that would be a more Christian language, all saying the same thing. That we should be su suspicious of this world and its temptations. Like Satan might try to ensnare you with pleasure. <laughs> you wouldn't want pleasure, would you? <laughs> That stuff makes you feel good. <laughs> Dangerous. Like we're going to get trapped by this world. And we can be. We can be. I had fun with those lines. But how many people have you have ever seen who failed to resist uh, temptation to the point that it destroyed them? You know, so there is some reality in that. It's fun to make fun of it, too, because it kind of brings me to my next point. There's an older religion of which we just get echoes and impressions. A religion so old, it's as old as astrology. Think of its monuments. Think of Stonehenge, for example. Think of the pyramids, uh, both the, the ones in the Americas and, and the, the famous ones in Egypt. Think of Angkor Wat. We could add more to the list. Monuments based on celestial configurations, the, the three main pyramids of Egypt, of course, echoing the exact geometrical relationship of the three stars in Orion's belt, for example, and on and on and on. That's not fundamentally what this talk is about, but clearly our ancestors were building these monuments on the earth to our resonance with the sky, to our appreciation with the sky, to our identification with, with the sky. And in this framework, these pagan religions, as we were taught to call them, often it was taken that this world, our life in this world, in these bodies, was potentially a path to a higher ground. It was not simply a place where we would learn to resist temptation, but a place where we could use worldly, earthly experience as a way of attuning ourselves to the infinite. Such religions tended to be affirmative of sex, for example, but affirmative of dancing, of, of friendship, of art, of, of both genders and all the genders in between. There was that tendency in these pagan frameworks. And again, the underlying notion of there being a spirituality inherent in our humanness and somehow representing a pathway that we could follow to the higher ground. The best statement I've ever read of this was by the late great poet 
Robert Bly, some of you may know his work. And Robert Bly once said, astrology is the great intellectual triumph of the mother goddess civilization. I find that to be an incredibly powerful statement. The great intellectual triumph of the mother goddess civilization. It's where astrology's roots lie, way back in prehistory. I know it's common to, to credit, and rightfully, the, the Hellenistic astrologers for being the originators of so many of the techniques that we use today. Fair enough. But the people who built the pyramids, the people who built Stonehenge, were not doing science, you know, drinking instant coffee out of a styrofoam cup with their slide rules and their calculators, you know. Those are clearly religious, spiritually significant monuments. Astrology, in some form, is ancient. Our sense of a soul relationship with the heavens is as ancient as the first, was it a monkey or was it a human? to look to the heavens and feel wonder. That's really what it's all about. So what if this world is not something to be transcended, but something to be used uh, as an abstract principle? What if we can say the same about our bodies and our human lives and thus our birth charts? They are vehicles for a potential awakening. What if your birth chart may cast light on your nature and your fate? But what if it's so much more than that? What if it's your path home? What if it shows the fastest route to the higher ground for you personally? Unlike any religion, which will speak generically, but your own particular path. I will give you a concrete example of this in, in just, just a moment. But before I get there, I'm an evolutionary astrologer. And here's a question we evolutionary astrologers always bring to the table. One of the distinguishing characteristics of evolutionary astrology, the question we attempt to answer is not what does your chart mean? All astrologers will attempt to answer that. But we ask, why do you have it? Why do you have the chart that you have? Once we see that astrology works, and any fool with a halfway open mind can see that it works. We all know that. I know I'm preaching to the choir on that one. But once we see that it works, there are only two possibilities for why it works. Either the universe is random or something purposeful made you have that chart. It's one or the other. You know, astrology could work for the same reason the Pythagorean theorem works or e equals mc squared works and the universe of the Big Bang and boom, a little wind up astrological holograms and then we fall over dead. <laughs> Any takers? I didn't think so, you know. And so as soon as we reject that, which is logically is conceivable, you know, but as soon as the heart rejects the idea that everything is pointless and random, you're left with the idea that something made you have the chart that you have. And since, well, a critical link in the chain, you've had your birth chart since the moment of your birth, of course, by definition. Therefore, anything that made you have the chart that you have had to happen before you were born. There's no other logical way of framing it. The cause has to precede the effect. The birth chart is an effect. Now this emphatically, I'm not trying to sell this as a proof of reincarnation. It is not a proof of reincarnation, but it is consistent with reincarnation. There might be other ways of understanding it. I personally accept reincarnation. So everything in the chart, I believe, let's call it karmic, so every symbol in your chart has two meanings. One of them, what hung you up in the past, and the other, how to get free of it, how to get beyond it. Every planet you have is a problem. Every planet you have is a solution for that problem. This is what I mean 
when I speak of astrology being this map home, this link between the personality and the actual transcendent spirit realm. Think of the phenomenon of someone with Saturn conjunct Venus in their natal chart. And we know what some of the gloomy fortune tellers would say, you know, you're not exactly lucky in love, you know, with Saturn <laughs> conjunct Venus. And if we argue against that, those astrologers can roll out sad story after sad story about people with Venus conjunct Saturn in the chart. Of course, we can also find some good stories too. So what's going on there? Just as one concrete illustration of the whole point of this talk. I want to insert a little story that will take us there. I am so grateful and honored to be 74 years old and having only once had a dishonest job the rest of my life being an astrologer. What a, <laughs> what a privilege it's been. But there are times when I wished I'd taken up a career in refrigerator repair. Here's an example of that. <laughs> There's a, a young couple, beautiful young couple, loved each other very much, married happily, and uh, two kids, little twin boys, just a happy family. And the husband and the two little boys are killed in a car accident. And here I am a counselor, wishing I was a refrigerator repairman, of course, because <laughs> what do you say to a woman who's just lost her beloved husband and her two beloved boys? I did my best. Five years later, she comes back to me. She's uh, trying to live again. Trying to, here's, here's a word that just puts tears in my eyes, a phrase, trying to get over it. How do you get over it? You know? But she's trying to live and she's seeing a man and this man wanted to marry her. She felt like she was being unfaithful to her husband. The man said one of the sweetest things a man can say to a woman. He said, I would like to have children with you. And it was like hitting her with a cattle prod. She'd lost two children. She didn't want to have children again. She didn't want to make herself vulnerable to that again. She left this man. She broke up with him. She just couldn't do it. Her grief was unresolved five years later. Is anybody going to give her trouble about that? I don't think so. I mean, the indelicate question, how long does it take to get over something like that? It's tempting to say you never get over something like that, but... Metaphysically, never is a really dangerous word to use. Everything is impermanent, even your grief, even the fact that you're not enlightened. Don't get attached to that. <laughs> Happy news, right? Impermanence, impermanence. But let's say, and we can say this with compassion, she goes to her grave with that grief unresolved. None of us would criticize her for that, a blow of that magnitude, the poor woman. Let's say she comes out the other end of the grave, known as the birth canal. Welcome, welcome to the wonderful world of reincarnation. And that grief is still there. What does her new chart look like? Saturn conjunct Venus is a possibility, a bit of a blockage when it comes to love when it comes to trust, when it comes to being that vulnerable again. This is evolutionary astrological thinking. This is, this is the mindset of it, where we see that Saturn-Venus conjunction and we don't attribute to this person, well, you have some real issues around intimacy. You know? This kind of shaming psychological language and it's replaced with insight and compassion. Now, I, I wanna be careful here. Saturn-Venus conjunction doesn't necessarily mean unresolved grief or bereavement in a prior life. That's one thing it can mean. It could mean abandonment, but somewhere the rug was pulled out from underneath you long ago. So there you are. There's your problem. Wherever you have planets, you got problems. <laughs> Count on that. But you've also got the answers. I need a shot of whiskey, excuse me. <laughs> oh, that helps. 
So trying to do the Saturn great work, there's a Saturn phrase, of recovering your Venus, recovering your ability to love and trust. Now, one thing about love and trust, nobody can learn anything about them all by themselves. It requires another human being. You can sit on the mountaintop and think about love and think about trust, that's good. You make some progress. But where the rubber meets the road is with another human being. So who's gonna help you? Well, answer here, Saturn-Venus conjunction, who's gonna help you? It's gonna be a Saturn person. And a lot of old astrologers or old fashioned ones, I don't mean like traditional, I just mean old fashioned, rigid astrologers, you know, would say, well, what a bomber you have Saturn, Venus, who's gonna help you? Well, you know, maybe you'll marry somebody like way older than you and really boring. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That'll work, right? <clears throat> Dark view of Saturn. Saturn is integrity. Saturn is character. Saturn is the part of you that can resist a temptation. How would you like to be in love with somebody who was really cute but couldn't resist temptation? I mean, none of us want to volunteer for that. What if you got trust issues in the first place? So let's turn this around. Saturn conjunct Venus, who is going to help you resolve this old karmic dilemma? Somebody trustworthy. You got trust problems, who's gonna help you? Somebody trustworthy. It sounds almost silly to say it. It's a path. And we could imagine someone born with a fear of loving and probably with some history that reflects that, falling in love with the wrong people, falling in love with people who are far away, falling in love with people who are married to somebody else, you know, falling in love with, uh, with, with people who are incapable of commitment, on and on, all the kind of nine yards of the sad reading of a Saturn-Venus conjunction. And the person may very well live that and then decide they're sick of living that and then sit with an astrologer and maybe get the insights and realize what the nature of their path forward is. And let's imagine a person who's, uh, I got actually a concrete example in mind, but I don't want to name any names. A person who's, feel free to laugh, whose fifth marriage worked. <laughs> I mean, keep on trying, right? <laughs> The fifth marriage worked. Okay, it worked. And these two that I have in mind, they're like 20 years down the road now. Imagine how you feel at the end of your life. You've made it work. You've made the spiritual breakthrough. Doesn't that feel spiritual that you recovered your ability to love? You came out of that wounded condition and you recovered and reclaimed your ability to love and to trust and to connect. Is that spiritual progress? My Scorpio rising showing, I just picture those two people making love. I don't want to picture it too vividly, you know, but I <laughs> picture them making love and here's a little Scorpio stuff. Maintaining eye contact through the point of orgasm. How much do you have to trust somebody? How much do you have to love somebody to do that? I'm talking spiritual breakthrough, you know, yeah. Okay, thank you. So this is the reconciliation of spirituality and astrology. It's the same as the reconciliation of spirit and flesh. Buddhists speak of skillful means, like you have a strong heartfelt desire to you know, improve, to grow, that's laudable, but attach it to methods that actually work and that's evolutionary rocket fuel. And your birth chart is the nature of that evolutionary rocket fuel for you. There are basic moral principles that are fundamental to spiritual health for everybody. Every religion catalogs them in pretty much the same way. Don't kill people, don't steal, and don't vote for fascists, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
But see, you don't need an astrological chart to know that those principles apply to you. That's everybody, one size fits all. Astrology comes in at the next level, individual one. Like, here's a dumb question. Is it a good idea to move to Ecuador? Well, what makes that a dumb question? We've left out a critical ingredient. Who are we talking about? You know, there's some people move to a foreign country and it opens their hearts, their minds, and it's the best thing they ever did. Other people, they just feel lonely, homesick. It's not a moral question. It's a question of individuality. It's a question of your path, which may not be the same as my path. And these are the kinds of questions that a chart answers. Now, if you live that life indicated by your chart, you win the grand prize. You come to your last breath on this earth with a smile on your face. That's the grand prize. You'll sense intuitively and with absolute confidence that you live the life that you were born to live. And there is no greater victory on this earth than that, coming to the end of this incarnation with that kind of feeling. How do you get there? You'll be ready for whatever is next on your deathbed. You'll, you'll feel no more attachment to this life because it served its purpose. It's like, just like you graduated from high school and you didn't have the slightest desire to start over again as a freshman, right? <laughs> you graduated. And so even your death is easier. I don't know about physical realities of death. There's a lot of variability there. But the psychological and spiritual experience of death, if you've lived the life you were born to live, your death feels right, righteous, and right on schedule. You have no problem with it in principle. So have a moment of compassion for people who lie on their deathbeds, realizing they watch television. And that was it or made money, and that was it. Just compassion, not judgment. It must be awful. So this is the sacred message woven into every birth chart. It's your path home. It's about the life you were born to live, the one that shakes you loose from your unresolved karma and shows you the fastest route to the higher ground for you in particular. Now, Astrologers can talk about the personality in psychological terms, and we're good at that. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's just avoid falling for the false myth of some kind of static personality, as, as if our personality were some kind of North Star that just stood there unmoving. People change. People evolve. My favorite way of underscoring this point, I invite you to think of how dumb you were 10 years ago. <laughs> no offense, but in, in fact, if, you're, if you can't relate to that, you probably haven't made much progress. You know? <laughs> 10 years, we can relate to it pretty easily, but I suspect uh, you're wiser now than you were when I started this talk. Not because of this talk, maybe it helped, I hope so, you know, hope so, but maybe we're evolving, not just decade by decade, but second by second by second. That's why I call myself an evolutionary astrologer, really, there's reincarnation and all the metaphysics in the background, but really I'm an evolutionary astrologer because I believe we are evolving and I want to help people evolve and I want to try to aim them in directions of the most skillful and efficient paths of, of their evolution, second by second or year by year or month by month. I personally don't believe we can see the future specifically. I, I've never been much of a fan of prediction in that sense, uh, mostly because I do believe in this potential for evolution. You become a different person. You have a long talk with yourself. The next morning you get out of bed, you make different decisions. They're gonna land you in a different future than the one you would have landed in had you been too lazy to do that evolutionary work today. That just feels quite logical. So for that reason, I don't like to predict the future, but I do feel that we can predict questions that people will face at a given time. 
We can describe the possibilities they will face. We can counsel them about the wisest responses to all of that. So I tie prediction into all of this. But let's not forget the heart of the message. You are an ancient, luminous soul on a mysterious journey through a universe that is an incubator of higher consciousness. And it can be pretty confusing. Would a map be helpful? <laughs> Have a look at the map of the sky at the instant you took your first breath in this body. That's your ticket home. Thank you. <laughs>